Thank you very much, Jonathan and Miranda. We're very um, happy and thrilled to be here to be able to talk in conversation, but also in conversation to you. Um, so I'll start with some questions of Dr Samara and then we'll open it up to the floor because we'd like it to be a really informal discussion. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the Aboriginal people of this land. Um, it always is, was and will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'm going to start with some very broad questions and then we'll move through those to some more personal questions so we get a sense of the remarkable woman that Dr Samara is. Um, first of all, um, Dr Samar, you spent, has spent the last 40 years working with regime after regime in Afghanistan, if it wasn't the working, not with, but probably against, I should say, fighting for human rights and women's rights. So if it wasn't the, the Soviet Union, it was the Mujahideen, if it wasn't them, it was the Taliban and so on. I'm wondering, Dr Samar, how you feel about the situation now relative to the last 40 years the current political situation and security situation in Afghanistan. How do you feel about that? Is it a point of optimism? Um, first of all, good afternoon to everybody and thank you for giving me this opportunity to come here and I pay my respect to the Aboriginal people of your country. I don't know how to say it, but I join you to, res to pay my respect to them. Um, I think, yes, there, there is a, a lot of positive changes in the country after the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, including if we look at the uh, access to education for boys and girls. Uh, I think before, the, uh, before the, this current regime, or during the Taliban, maybe we had around 800 or 700,000 people, children going to the school in different parts of the country. There were some school running by different NGOs, including my uh, my NGO. Uh, now it's it's over eight million at least. I mean, there's a uh, the government is giving a high number because there's not a, a proper data in the government. They just list the the students who come and join. They do not count the dropout and, and so on. So that is uh, the, because of the difference of the number of the government and the difference of the number that we, as a Human Rights Commission, monitor the situation. If you look at the access to health care, I think there's a, a, a much better bit than before. Uh, during Taliban, maybe 10% of the people had the access to basic health services, but now it's, uh, according to the Human Rights Commission, monitoring, it's 57% of people has access to basic health services. Of course, the quality is not good and it's not as, as high as you have in your country, but at least the people do know that there is a clinic and there uh, might be a doctor and a female midwife or a female doctor to go to. Uh, in terms of rule of law, uh, for example, when we went in 2002 in Afghanistan or in late 2001, we didn't have any system in the country. No police, no army, no judge. The people who came in, particularly the police, the, the people, the militias of different political party who came in and they just had the police uniform and they were acting as a police. Of course they were not trained police. Currently at least we have a police in the country and they are under a certain rule of law. I'm not saying that they are trusted 100% by the people, but it's every day it's getting better and uh, the people trust the police and support the police. We have army, we didn't have army because at the beginning uh, different political party was saying that we have one million people, so they wanted the government to, have, to pay for one million people and then it was a kind of bargaining that 500,000, 300,000, now we have actual army who is in the payroll. Of course, there is a, a corruption here and there, but they really try to overcome uh, and reduce the corruption, including uh, payment of the salaries to their bank account, or because we, I mean, there was a rumor of ghost police, ghost army member, and so on, ghost teachers, but now they are trying to, um, to send to everybody's bank account through banking, so it, it it's, does reduce the, uh, the corruption and ghost existence of different people. Um, yes, the insecurity uh, is bad, I mean, because we didn't have the proper uh, 
rule of law and proper police and army and so on, uh, the system were not there to, to provide all these uh, rule of law in the country. Uh, uh, it's getting better, but uh, um, in terms of rule of law, but we still have, unfortunately, warlords in the country. We still have the opposition, the armed opposition against the government. And all these opposition or the extremists choose the um, different extreme way of violence, including the suicide attack. Because at least in Afghanistan, during while we were fighting with the Russians, we had no suicide, um, no single suicide attack in Afghanistan, because it was not known to the people. I mean, they were running to the Russian tanks and climbing on the, on the Russian tanks, tried to, to pull out the Russian soldier from the tanks, but they were not really doing the suicide uh, attacks to kill themselves in order to destroy the tank. But this is not the case today. It's not only in Afghanistan, and unfortunately, uh, last week we had in, in England and some other countries, because they are a group of people who are brainwashed, who are convinced that they could kill themselves to go to heaven, uh, which is not the case in Islam, actually. So uh, we still face some, some challenges. And uh, of course, poverty is one of the, the problems within the country. Uh, and it, poverty really pushed people, poverty and discrimination pushed the people to that extent to commit very brutal kind of uh, uh, action. Okay, you mentioned um, warlords, and there's been a lot of discussion lately about whether there's a military solution or a political solution to the situation in Afghanistan, and whether there should be uh, compromises and negotiations and alliances made with organisations such as the Taliban or warlords such as Hekmatia. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think there's no doubt, there's no single solution to, to any conflict. So there's no fixed uh, kind of a rule that you can apply this on the conflict in order to solve it. Uh, it should be a mix of, uh, of a long-term strategy. In my view, peace is not uh, um, to end the war and not having explosion in the city or in the, in the country. Peace is about justice. Peace is about the human security. People have to feel secure, including, for example, that's why I, I'm fighting with the government that they should focus on good governance and provision of basic social services to the people. Then the people will be supportive of the government and state institution, and then that can facilitate the peace process in the country. So I'm not in favor of peace without justice. And I think that we should have peace with justice. Otherwise, it will not be sustainable. We will have an agreement, and maybe we will have three weeks or four weeks or a year of quietness, and then it will start again in some part, in some way. Uh, and of course, I prefer to sit on the table and negotiate rather than kill the people and, and try to, to be um, attack on the school and hospital and destroy the the bridges that we had. Whatever we had in Afghanistan was destroyed during the Russian invasion and, and fighting and then internal fight among the Mujahideen group. They did not, they discriminately bombed everywhere and uh, destroyed bridges, roads and everything. So now we start to build some bridges. Again, if we destroy all those things, it, it's not going to be helpful. But with condition that they at least should should acknowledge the suffering of the people. The reason I'm saying is that we hold, the Human Rights Commission hold a national consultation with the, with the people. In 2004, um, we had interviews with random selection of people. We were asking, for example, to go to this street and stop, count the people and stop the, the 11th person, whoever they are. If it's a shopkeeper, if it's a labor, if it's a teacher, if it's an army person, or whoever, an interview about the past crimes committed in Afghanistan, how we should go and how we should deal it with. And then we had focus groups on the Chatham House discussion. We discussed how we should deal. And of course, we do not encourage taking revenge because revenge will continue the whole cycle of violence. 
And then we give some example of South Africa truth and reconciliation uh, process, and we uh, also give some, some example of Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and, and Balkans, of international courts, and so on. But then the people, uh, we had also involved the, the refugees in Iran and Pakistan, so it was more than 7,000 people who participated in this national consultation from all over the country, because uh, on that time it was easy to go to almost to every pro uh, district. If they were not able to reach to the district, we were sending our staff to the bus station or to the station where the people were coming from that district. So somehow it was all people in the different corner of the country were involved. They came up with five recommendations. One was to acknowledge the suffering of the people, which doesn't require a big budget, doesn't require really a, a, a very big uh, association or, or mediator. The second thing was to promote the cultural and Islamic values in order to promote forgiveness and do some uh, symbolic acts in order to, to reduce the, 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 the pain and try to heal the wound of the people which was made during different period of war in the country. Uh, the third was to document the past crimes in order to use as a history and also use it as a lesson learned for the, new, uh, for the future generation of the country. Fourth was vetting of the uh, people who are accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity, not the pity crimes, not the killing of one person, although it is a crime, but uh, to vet those people from the position of power within the state structure. Fifth was a hybrid kind of a prosecutor office or a court within Afghanistan in order to have uh, to facilitate the people's access. Of course, the fifth one was too far, in, uh, but it was the desire of the people. I think 79% of the people who participated in this uh, national consultation was somehow had lost someone or directly or indirectly, their, their rights were violated. So this is really an important outcome. Based on that, we worked on, with the international community, with the UN, for an um, action plan for transitional justice. And the aim that we were promoting, that it lead to a better reconciliation to sustainable peace, rather than uh, go and sign an agreement and give some, some bribe to them to bring them back to the they are not coming to the normal life because they still think that they are the one who preserve or deserve all the all the rights and financial uh, support from the government. So that was uh, um, based on the the recommendation of the people. The action plan was made exactly the same five action, uh, and it was signed. It was agreed by the Afghan government, by the international community, by the UN, and by us in the London conference. Unfortunately, a lot of action has not been taken, but 10th of December, we, I pushed and pushed the president, 10th of December is announced as a national memorial day of uh, victims of violence in the country. So now the people, on 10th of December, the people goes and light a candle or goes to the uh, place where a lot of massacre or mass grave is done by the regime on that time by the Russian mainly to that area and then speeches and they take some flower. This year they put a lot of stones with the name of some of the victims with their photos in that area. And the second thing, we, the Human Rights Commission, we built a small museum on the mass grave in Badakhshan and uh, we put everything in the, uh, in the boxes which was found in that mass grave. So now the people do use that place as a, as a shrine, kind of. A, the people come and pray and cry, and, and it's a place that the people could think <coughs> that their loved one is, was here. Uh, nobody actually did the historical part that which time was this grave, or uh, they wanted to, to build uh, high rises or something. 
and they found the the body and the remaining of the of the people in that grave. So so we do did that uh, action, and there is another small kind of a memorial um, uh, for the uh, other victims of. It is particularly for 78 and 79. After that, it's very complicated because it was a lot of killing within the community by different people. So we put the name of 101 person from one specific uh, district, only from the 78 and 79. If you collect the name of all the victims, it's really a lot. I mean, we might not be able to, to do anything. On the... Uh, Documentation, the Human Rights Commission did a documentation of uh, a mapping of the uh, crimes committed from 78 until 2001. It's 880 pages of document, the big event we, we looked at. And unfortunately, because of security, it's, because it is a gov governmental action plan and we took that responsibility, uh, the government is not there to publish that report because they don't want to upset some of their friends, warlord friends. Uh, on the vetting, we were able to establish a, a advisory board for the president, for the deputy ministers, for um, governors, for chief of police, for district commissioners, and also the head of intelligence service. And then it was th th there was a lack of commitment by the president, actually. They removed the intelligence service, it's confidential. So then they slowly removed the police. But we were able to, because we had one of our staff uh, as, the, as a member of that advisory board who is currently the um, attorney general in the country. So we did, we did remove some people. But the, the Constitution is, uh, one of the articles in the Constitution is saying that the people who are convicted by a court on war crimes and crimes against humanity cannot stand for public office, cannot stand on election. But who's convicted? Because we didn't have an impartial, capable, enabled court in the country. So now we have this, after the, uh, unfortunately, the attack in 9-11, the intervention of the international community Unfortunately, the international community again choose some of these warlords, very brutal warlords. Still, they are friends of them. So uh, that is a, a, is a big problem for the government also because these warlords and these people have connection with some of the stakeholders in Afghanistan, so they try to promote their, their own friends within the state and institution. And it's a problem for, for uh, the government. And then Hekmatyar is one of those people who continue fighting and killing Americans and Afghans and NGOs and a lot of other people, including my own commissioner. Unfortunately, she and her husband and four children, they went to a shop. Uh, it was one of her daughter's birthday. And there was a suicide attack over there. All six died there. A commissioner from the Human Rights Commission, a very nice and good woman, who was a very good friend of Nasima. Uh, we, in his Islami, Hikmatyar, claimed the responsibility, and they still say that they did it uh, uh, based on Islam, Islamic uh, um, responsibility. Uh, he continued the war, and then now somehow it's he contacted the government, or government contacted him, and he came with a lot of benefit. First, it's immu impu immunity, we call impunity. <laughs> immunity for him and for his people. Second is that uh, they will release the people who are belonging to his Islami, who are in prison, from the detention center in prisons from Afghanistan. Third is the special benefit, benefit, financial benefit to the people who belong to this political party to give a town for them or to a city for them or land and facilitate the, to have their own town. Uh, they had a camp in, in Pakistan where they were kidnapping people and killing a lot of people in that camp and same people once, same style of setup they want in Afghanistan and we are opposing to that because it will not help. Uh, 
four, I think it was the the reintegration of his people in the army and the police. So what I, in the Human Rights Commission, we did, I hold a press conference after the agreement was signed. I said, one, nobody can, can forgive war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is international crime, and they should be accountable. And nobody can forgive on behalf of a victim. Two, all of pe uh, the people of Hizb Islami who are already in prison and convicted by court because of a crime they committed cannot be released unconditionally because they killed people. For example, the one who did organize the attack and my own colleague was killed, the entire family, how can he, he can be released? Uh, the said, third issue on giving a specific special financial benefit to these people, you just encourage the people to continue violence in order to get financial benefit. Four, on the reintegration of their people within the army and police, I said it should be a, a strong background check. Otherwise, you just put them in the army and the police, and they will kill the army and police within the structure. I mean, we had the attack from inside on the people recently in, in different places. And in Mazar Sharif, we had, we lost 200 young people. Uh, then this, the other problem, if they are in the police, if they are in the army, they will kill me. And I told to the UN, I said, they will kill you also with the police uniform, with the army uniform, because we rely on them and they will kill. Thirdly, they will be the one who might do a coup d'etat in Afghanistan. So what is about all this gain and promotion of democracy, although I'm not saying that we are really a democratic country, but still, when part of the people are coming and taking risk and going to vote, and their hand is cut, their finger is cut. This is a commitment of the people to the process. So how we can just give up everything because we bring a warlord, which is belong to a certain ethnic group, and we want to support our ethnicity. I think that criminal is criminal, and they don't have ethnicity, and they don't have any tribe. So we should treat them as a criminal, and we should provide justice to the victim of victims of, of human rights violation in the country. Sorry, I've gone too long. No, it's fascinating. Too long and, and, and too far. No, 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 because you've covered a whole range of things from, I think, um, the universal theme of people who have suffered to be acknowledged, and that's happening here, even this week for us with our Aboriginal community, um, and that that is a path to to peace, that um, war is, you know, peace is not just the absence of war, it's the presence of justice. Absolutely. And I think that's a universal theme and it speaks also to the universal theme of human rights. Um, I mean, you touched on your own individual bravery and risk taking and the, the context in which you and your commissioners operate, whether it's through criminal activity or suicide bombing or direct targeting, because we know that uh, Dr. Samar is on a number of death lists still. Um, yeah, recently with his Muslim. With, with, with these guys. <laughs> and I guess also the risks around using the term a political solution to mask the integration of criminals back into the government and the risks that that takes. So a political solution is not so simple. Um, it should be a combination of... A combination. So given, given pieces around justice but also security, what are your thoughts um, that were raised on the issue that were raised today, I don't know if any of you heard Dr. Samara on Radio National, but um, preceding Dr. Samara, Barnaby Joyce spoke about the decision that the Australian government's going to be taking soon around sending more troops back to Afghanistan. Uh, so maybe your thoughts on whether that's the best investment Australia can make or there are other things that Australia could do that would better uh, progress a sense of peace. I think it's a combination of uh, all uh, uh, one of the problems that you all know that it was since 2001, 
uh, a lot of uh, financial investment and a lot of life who were sacrificed in Afghanistan. And the reason that we are not convinced or I'm not convinced with the achievement by all the sacrifice that we made, by all the money that was spent in Afghanistan, is because of lack of coordination and lack of clear strategy what we want. Imagine that until 2007 or 8, the international community would not agree that how many armed defense forces we should have. 600, 500, 200,000, 300,000. Finally, they decided in 2010 or 11 that 353,000 300, armed forces. It is police, army, and intelligence service. The intelligence service in Afghanistan, unfortunately, is not only collecting the information, they are also taking part on, uh, as a combat. So it's, um, it is decided. And then we had search by Obama administration in Afghanistan. And then after a quick search, they said that we will withdraw from Afghanistan. And everybody left Afghanistan prematurely, not gradually. And then every, they were waiting that, OK, when they leave, then we would know what to do with Afghanistan. That's why they, we have more increase on the number of attacks and violence. And uh, that is not the only solution. I think it should be a combination, a long-term strategy with multi-dimension. And I insist that we should focus on good governance and rule of law in the country, including training of our of armed forces because they should take the responsibility. And I keep saying that the actual force and the main force in any country is the people of that country. The others can facilitate, can help us to come out of that problem. So one of the problems that we were facing, it was 49 countries who had soldiers in Afghanistan. 49 countries. Everybody was doing it in their own way. Still, this is the case, because we have NATO forces. We face some of these uh, foreign soldiers who do not speak a single word in English. And we ca cannot communicate with them. They're from Georgia. They're from Estonia. They're from, I don't know, Serbia. And then we have difficulties to communicate with them. I give you an example I was supposed to see with the British general who's responsible for Ministry of Interior. We were discussing for the uh, promotion of women within the police system and, and army. So he, he called me, he said, can we have a meeting, specific meeting, because I want to hear your opinion and ideas. So we set up the, the meeting. Uh, first he said he's coming to my office, and then he said it's the security problem, if you can come. So security is only for them, not for me. I mean, I, it doesn't matter if I am killed. So I said, OK, I go. I went there. And then the, at the gate, it was a Georgian soldier who said, Madam, we need to do the biometric of you, of me. And I said, I don't want to be to treat it as a suspect. This country has only one Sima Samar. It's not 50 of us. So I'm not going through biometrics. So I left. I turned, I asked the driver to turn the, the car back. It's hurting you. It's hurt your, your dignity. Then they call and said, can you come back? We facilitate. And I said, no, thank you. Please treat us with dignity. Yes, we are not educated as you are. We are not rich as you are but treat the people with dignity. And that is what I'm fighting for. I'm looking at your uh, fighting for. Fighting for <laughs> But we really fight to be recognized and acknowledged as a human being. So then a the, uh, few nights before, uh, maybe two nights before I was coming here, um, the British ambassador had a dinner in there was a, a member of the parliament who came to, to Kabul. And they had the birthday of Queen. They invited us. I went in some, of course, the other people. Right? It was a lot of people. So they sent me a VIP card. So I drove until the gate. 
And then again, a lady who took me and said, can we do a quick search, body search? And I said, thank you. I left, so I didn't go. Next day when I saw the ambassador and the MP, and I said, I'm sorry I came, but I, they were asking me to go through a body search, and I keep fighting for this. It is with, not with one particular uh, embassy, but it is, it has happened also with Australian embassy. Then they, they invited me for dinner. Then this general, who was responsible, uh, who is still responsible to work with the Ministry of Interior, he was also there. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I left because I cannot bear to go in my own country in the position that I have through a body search in order to participate on your reception for a Queen birthday. They said, no, we are sorry, it was misunderstanding. And I said, yes, the, all good will and all the money you spend here, you create hatred. This is Seema Samar who do not believe on violence, but I do act strangely. I leave and I go, but it make me dis disturb my mind, my action. Of course, they apologize. And I said I did the same thing with the, uh, with the general. The general was sitting there. The next day, he wrote an email, I can come to your office, and I still want to discuss with you all these issues. But then I was coming here, so I said, I'm sorry when I can. <laughs> when I'm back from Australia. We have Australian uh, gender advisor. You saw one of them. Before that, there was another nice uh, lady. Uh, there's an advisory board with resolute support. This is the international group, uh, international forces. Uh, and we had the meeting there, and then uh, we plan for a working group how to how to deliver the uniform for the female police how to deal with their salary how to give them uh, transportation because we, we propose that it should not be uh, a transportation for them because they can be easily targeted if they can pay for their transportation so everyone can come the way they want and then how to do that because to reduce corruption, uh, the, the money should be reached to these girls and so on, and it was a working group. So I, I was a volunteer. I said I can host this working group within the Human Rights Commission. Then the security issue, this lady, Australian lady, she said, can we do it in the um, residential uh, residence of the ambassador, Australian ambassador? And I said, yes. We arrived there, and then again, because they hire company for their security. It is, uh, I think it's Nepalese. And Madame, we have to go through a quick search. And I said, excuse me, I just turned. And then this girl ran after me, please, please, Seema, come. And I said, no, it's, it's not the right way. Please treat us with dignity. I mean, a lot of other Afghans are not fighting for these things, but I do because I said, it's my job. Unfortunately, <laughs> and I'm fulfilling my job. So she, then, ambassador came to the gate and said, I, I, "I'm sorry, I apologize." Then I went in. These are small things, but to value all the ex the money that you spend, the money of your taxpayer, and the the life that you sacrifice in Afghanistan, and to be more effective then you need to treat the people with dignity. So I think it does require a proper long-term strategy. It is not possible to do it in one year. We have not uh, uh, provide full security to the people in Afghanistan in 16 years, so it might take another 16 years to realize that. But I do believe that if we invest on education, if we invest on uh, provision of basic health services to the people, to give sense of security, of a human security to the people. Because it's not only physical security. It's not only suicide attack. It is that I should be convinced that my daughter is going to school and she comes back in one piece. And I should know that I 
will have a heart attack and there's a hospital that I could go. Yeah. Currently, we don't have that human security. That's why a lot of people are leaving the country. That's why you have a lot of people that. And I said to your Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I said, invest in Afghanistan to reduce the people coming to Australia. And the people who comes here to your country, they really don't know where they go. And I, because I was with the Afghan community last night, one of them said that they were in the, sh in the ocean, in the water, for 29 days, 29 days. And they, uh, the water was finished. And uh, you all know that the ocean water is not drinkable. It may it make them more thirst. And they said that they were thinking that they will not ar ar arrive alive in Australia. So these are, that's why I said, can you please keep the one who is already here? And last time when I was here, I said, can you give, you have a lot of land, give them a land and make them to work as a farmer for you, produce food for you, keep your sheep, and then you can have a lot of meat to export <laughs> to the other countries. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. I think it's, it's Whatever uh, is your country, how poor is it, how dusty, how bad is the condition of, of living there, it's your own country. It is your own piece of dirt or land that you feel that I belong to it. It's very, very difficult to live without um, actual identity. And I lived, I gone through it in Pakistan, and it was really difficult. Sorry, yeah. before I get What's emotional. Talking? So. <laughs> talking? Talking? How much, what are we? Yeah, no, I'm a young man. It's about seven minutes to one. Oh my goodness. Um, well, we'll quickly open up. I have obviously a whole list of other questions, but um, we I'm are sorry, running I out spoke of time. Too long. No, you did not. Um, thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Um, I'm happy to fill in if you don't, but please. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the right. increased trust and confidence in the police force. And I wonder if that's translated into improvement for access to justice for victims of gender based violence? Um, um, yes, I think gender based violence is, a, is, a, is still a very big issue in the country, and it's happening a lot. Yes, when the police knows that it is a crime, because the, uh, most of our police, unfortunately, are uneducated, and they just join police, and they think it's normal. You know, the gender-based violence, particularly the domestic violence, is untouched. I mean, the people think that it's their private business, so we don't need to interfere. Now it's a different because with the awareness that the people get, they call me, for example, in the middle of the night and say that our neighbor is beating his wife or there was a case that they killed their daughter-in-law and they wanted to throw the body to the, uh, to the river. There is one Afghan river goes to Pakistan, so they wanted to throw the body and then claim that she ran away. So it was quite late at night, and then I called the chief of police. I called our staff, and our staff called the chief of police. And then the police, of course, took, got the body and arrested that mother-in-law and the husband. This really gives the, the hope. Otherwise, I mean, the confidence of the people within the system. So. It is very uh, remote part of the country. Now, I don't know how she found the, the telephone number. She said that she is not educated, but she heard that she was beaten up every day. But now I see how she saw this family was taking the body with a little light because there is no electricity. 
to throw to. And then she was trying to, to with torch, to look. So they were running back to stop somehow not to throw the body in the, in the river. I mean, the people find a way how to, how to deal with it. And then finally she called us. We immediately, thanks to, to technology, we called the chief of police, and the chief of police went and found the, the house and the family. We said, she gave us the exact address where we live in which village. So we were able to stop that. This kind of activities are going on. I mean, they're calling from very remote part to our staff and to police. Uh, but yes, it is still requires a lot of uh, a lot of work. By the way, we have three thousand women in the police forces, and that's why we uh, keep asking that we need to give them to build their capacity to stay within the system. Um, Sally was there when I was speaking with your government that please spend some money in the sector. We have 3,000 women in the police force. We should keep them in the police. If we don't build their capacity, they'll continue to be team maker for the male member or male police officers for the generals. So we want them to get out of the kitchen in team maker business to be a real police officer. But please. Be in touch, and I think it's a moral responsibility. And I keep saying that the promotion and protection of human rights is shared responsibility. The problem will not stay in our boundary wall. It's reach you in, in different ways. Uh, I'm not saying only Afghanistan, but it's everywhere. Um, to make a better place for, for our children, we need to cooperate, we need to tackle and support the people who are in need. To save humanity and to, to believe on equal dignity for everyone. Any other questions? One and then two. Um, thank you. You are such an inspiration and we love you dearly. <laughs> and, and every time I've heard you speak, I've heard people say after, I wonder what we can do as individuals from a distance. And so I wondered, Sally, whether you'd just talk a little bit about what Indigo has done in Afghanistan and also Dr. Smart. What can we do as Australian women lawyers or uh, keen Australians to do something to help? What can we do? Should I go first? Well, I would like to thank Indigo because they're supporting our, um, again, I established a small uh, an institute of higher education for the girls, and it's called Gavashad. Gavashad is the name of a lady who did a lot of, uh, a queen who did a lot on, on literature and, and education. So I put her name on this university. And uh, we try to train the students a responsible citizen. So that's why we have a specific department, Women Empowerment Department. We had some a small project with Indigo uh, Research. I think they published it, and they funded some of the girls' scholarship. Because we do, it's a private, but it's non-profit, so we don't really uh, look at the, the institution as a profit uh, generated or generation. Um, so we charged a small amount to the girls, 12,000 Afghani, which is around less than $200 these days, for the girls for a semester. And it's uh, 15,000, it's a little more than $200 for the boys. So it's already a uh, discounted rate for the girls because we want to, to give possibility for the girls to get education. It's free for the orphans. It's free for the people with disability. And of course, we try for, to find scholarship for the girls. If not, it's free for the very poor one. Uh, but then uh, within this women empowerment uh, department, we, what we did actually, everybody came with their opinion in, on gender training. But we don't have any fixed curriculum for gender training within the Afghan context. Every NGO translated their own way, and some of them doesn't really give you any 
any idea that what is gender training. So we did work on a curriculum for gender training. And I think it's done partially, and we are waiting for, hopefully we'll find money for publishing these books to make the gender training a common within the Afghan uh, context. And then we do have uh, a kind of a peace training. Uh, this is uh, peace building, conflict prevention, and peace building within the, I mean, we began with the training of the students. We have a group of students who we were able to find some money to send to Gandhi Center in Delhi and to have an exchange. We have seminars, we train, uh, we talk about peace, we train, we hold workshops for the students. We teach human rights in every class. It's a, because it's under our control, of course, the Ministry of Higher Education doesn't have this kind of a, um, let's say, curriculum or, or subjects, but we do that in this Gawashad University. And hopefully we will be able to, to really uh, establish in an, a safer environment, a better environment for the Afghan. So you can donate to Indigo, Indigo can donate to us <laughs> to It's very important because you change the life of individual. I'm an individual. And the reason I'm too tough, because I had the tool that was my education. Otherwise, even my own family was thinking that I am their property. And I become widow, widow when I was quite young. I was only 23, um, and I had a son. So between the families, my in-laws was thinking that I belonged to them, and my own family was thinking that I belonged to them. And I thought that I belonged to myself. <laughs> uh, so it is really important to give the confidence and self-confidence through education to these girls to stand and live again with dignity. I mentioned dignity too much today, but yes. And I, and I can only obviously echo what, what Dr. Samar has said. I think uh, um, just to add a couple of things, many remarkable things about Dr. Samar, one of which is that she works within the broader context. I mean, she actually established the Independent Human Rights Commission, which was the first one ever in Afghanistan. There's now 14 officers across the country. Um, and works at that broad context level to, to create in Afghanistan an enabling community for girls and women, but at the same time is very practical and has set up the Gashawad Institute with the Women's Education Centre, which we are very privileged to support from the beginning. Um, and that, that, as Dr Smart said, the Women's Education Centre does a whole lot of programmatic stuff, but also supports through a scholarship program um, young girls and women who either can't afford to or are not allowed or supported to through their uh, culturally. Um, so supporting that would be fantastic. Um, we also have other programs in rural Afghanistan that we support um, networks of primary and high school students, which um, has had remarkable success uh, in terms of, again, creating a, an environment that is uh, supportive of girls and that demonstrates to the community that an investment in girls reaps its many rewards. Um, and as a consequence, there are higher rates of uh, girls' attendance in those schools. As with the Kashawa, there's the national, um, the national rate of girls in tertiary institutions is 15%, but in the institute here it's 35%. So again, a very practical um, method of empowering girls. Um, our program in Borjagai and Jirgai has led ultimately to a range of girls entering the tertiary institution sector and coming back as female, well obviously female, but coming back as teachers <laughs> and providing female <laughs> teachers in, in the schools, which is a reinforcing process and cycle because now the more conservative families feel much more comfortable to send their girls to these schools. And I um, mean, the, the, the classic indicator of progress there for us was when we first started, we were asked by the community, the tribal elders and the mullahs, to set up a girls' high school because 
although the education system was, was co-educational, um, because of the conservative nature of rural communities, many families were uncomfortable with sending their girls to school past puberty. Uh, so they said if it's a girls only high school, we're more likely to get them there. But it required in a village of 36,000, some of those girls having to walk for two hours a day to get there. A couple of years ago, the community came to us and they said, there are now female teachers in the network of schools that you've supported, at least one female teacher in each school. That's nine schools. Um, and we've built schools that have separate toilets for girls, which is really important. And we've done a lot of teacher training. And they said, we don't need the girls' high school anymore. Uh, we'd rather them not walk the two hours, but just to their local high school, because we feel confident that they are safe and we feel confident that when we invest in them they will come home and they will um, contribute to society. So it's a huge shift in 10 years around that. So I think, I mean, and what, what we can do here as individuals is one, recognise the absolute importance of investing in education, primary, high school and tertiary, but also to recognise that it's a long game. It takes 17 years to put one girl through that pathway of education um, and that's a commitment that we that we need to make and I think if anything I mean Dr Samar personifies that commitment um, it's a long game it's 40 years that she's fought for these rights and I think as, as she says it's it's a universal responsibility to support those girls and and so we're in it for the long term and we invite you to be as well yeah. there was yes yeah, sorry Yeah, we do have equal rights in the Constitution for men and women. And it's the first time that we were able to add the word woman in the Constitution because we were fighting for adding the word woman and there were uh, quite a large resistance against it. And they were saying that we would use the citizen and it's cover both. And we, we said, no, we want the word woman in the Constitution. We won the battle on that. Uh, and then, again, it's the first time in in our history that domestic violence is criminalized. Before, nobody was, even when they were killing their daughters, based on honor, nobody was interfering to the issue. This is not the case anymore. So it is a criminalized, and we have a law, elimination of violence against women law in the country, which was uh, signed by the president, President Karzai, as a decree, it's, we're still fighting with the parliament to, to pass it. But we have few conservative uh, but strong people in the parliament who try to remove four important articles from this elimination of violence against women, which is regarded to uh, the age of marriage and polygamy and these issues that they, the men like, it, but particularly the, uh, the Afghan conservative men. So it is there, and hopefully uh, it is enforced, actually. There's a lot of advocacy for that There's uh, to be implemented in different parts of the country. But again, we in the Human Rights Commission, we have a department of uh, women in, oh, department that does promotion and protection of women rights. And we do receive cases of violence, domestic violence, and we follow up with authorities with the court and, and, and there's a special prosecutor office uh, on violence against women but uh, my personal uh, argument with that yes it's good to have a specific department but I think it should be cross-cutting <coughs> in all the prosecutor office rather than uh, specifically in, we have prosecutor for violence against women, one, in some places it's one woman, in uh, other provinces where there's no female prosecutor, it's one man. It's the same issue. They are absent, they are busy, they, so the, people, <coughs> the woman doesn't have much access, and particularly they cannot trust the men enough. So I'm pushing for cross-cutting uh, inclusion of the uh, ac action against violence 
against women in all the pros in every prosecutor office and also in every court rather than having specific part because we cannot reach even if it's a prosecutor special prosecutor office but one person in the center of the province and practically it's more violence within the district and rural part of the country <coughs> so i we are but we are fighting yes we have a lot of achievement in that i mean 15 16 years ago nobody would have dreamed that we will have special prosecutor for violence against women, although I'm not very happy with it because we should not really isolate. And then if we have 10 prosecutors, we have one for violence against women, although 50% of, of population is women. So it's, uh, it's not very balanced and convincing, but yes, yeah. I have to wrap it up. So I'm just going to have a quick couple of comments. Um, I think, uh, I mean, Dr. Samar's bravery I've mentioned, um, but her integrity is unimpeachable. Um, I, I, I said, we've had some conversations and, um, you know, I said, who is it? Who, who are the other women, say, on the international stage that you look to uh, or anybody that you look to in that regard? And she said, no one. She said, I look to the people of Afghanistan. It's the poor people that trust the Human Rights Commission um, to do the right thing every single time and it's those poor people to whom she looks and to whom she serves and I think that speaks volumes. I think the other thing uh, that I'd like to say is that after f uh, all of, you know, the constant battle for human rights and women's rights, I was saying, well, you know, how do you keep going? What, what sustains you? How do you keep going? And she said, well, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, there's still progress to be made. And, and I flippantly said, well, I guess you've got no choice, you continue. And she said to me, no, 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 we all have choices, but I choose to be optimistic. And I think that, again, speaks to the, the remarkable resilience and power that you have. And I thank you on behalf of everybody here today. I would also very much like to thank Morris Blackburn Lawyers for hosting this and Miranda for organising it and, of course, Jonathan and PA for co-sponsoring. Um, it's wonderful to be able to partner with you and it's such a glorious day and a great location. Um, so we're going to have some lunch and invite you to join and if you've got any further questions, it's OK to ask. Thank you yeah. all. <laughs> thank you very much.